streaming? Are you live streaming? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. What is that? But I can't hear you. I can't hear you until you start. I'll turn it off. moment, I think. I think we had 50 RSVPs, but um, not quite 50 here just yet, but I know a few more might come through the door. Uh, so yeah, feel free to grab a chair, make yourself comfortable, um, and welcome to Morning Startup. My name is Scott Glue. I am a co-founder yeah, co of a business that I started in 2012, and wanted to get together with other entrepreneurs and startup folks. So we started Morning Startup in a coffee shop and now it is what it is today where we do, we do this every two weeks, rain, hail or shine, get a cool, interesting presenter and try and get as many of you folks into the same room as often as we can because that's when good things happen in Perth. Just trying to connect the community, connect founders to developers and all of that stuff. So hopefully you're in the startup space, cool to, uh, you're ready to learn something interesting and uh, talk to other folks, yeah? All right, cool, awesome. So, on that note, the way we like to get started, I've told you who I am, so now I'd like to know who you guys are. Okay, Jack, check it out, I'll put your banner up today, sweet. Um, so, if you've got a shameless plug or an announcement or something you'd like to get off your chest and let everyone in the room and on the live stream, so this has been beamed all around the world, so this is your time to shine. Who's got like a 20 second pitch, just want to let people know what you're doing? Legend. Hey everyone, I'm Jack from MO Marketing. Um, coming up in a couple of weeks is the Cyber West Summit. Um, we've been supporting them this year. Uh, it's a great conference, two day event. Um, I can also get you discounted tickets. So if you want discounted tickets, come chat to me afterwards. You can also get them discounted through Space Cubed if you're a startup. So, yeah. Excellent. Yeah, Cyber West is an awesome conference if you're in cybersecurity. Or I think they're pitching it as like the cybersecurity conference for people that aren't in cybersecurity. Yeah. <laughs> so go there if you want to learn about this stuff. It's pretty important. Um, anyone else? Just while you're all thinking about your own pitch, I'll do my pitch. So I'm Scott Blake, I'm the co-founder of FastView. We help schools and businesses monitor internet usage. So if you've got a kid searching for how to kill myself, we have alerts going to the right people, reports and dashboards for the IT team. Looking for back-end engineers, front-end developers, all those things, so get in touch if you want to work with me. Anyone else? Come on, there's got to be some more shameless plugs and announcements. Yeah. None? Did I hear her? Oh, no, no, not me, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, uh, look, I know um, we've got a big presentation on today, so I'm going to plug on and, and get on with it. We also have found a sundowner, so you know, if you're not, your brain's not switched on in the morning, might be at 5.30 p.m., come down to the pub and have a drink with other startup founders. That's the first Wednesday of every month, which I think is next week. Um, Ammo. So we just heard from Jack. They've been supporting Morning Startup for quite a long time now, a few years, uh, since the pandemic got underway. They uh, do growth marketing. They're very awesome. They're doing a lot of stuff around town with a lot of startups, a lot of folks. If you need to hit the accelerator in your business, uh, get in touch with uh, Jack and Cam and the guys at, guys at Ammo. They also have a really awesome podcast called Weird Growth. So go and make sure you subscribe to that. Uh, it's it's you know, interviews with startup folks and um, people around town. Also, Beecham Group. So Glenn isn't here, but we've got... Uh, Beecham Group been supporting Morning Startup actually even longer. So if you have talent, you need a cool gig, or you're looking to recruit people in IT, make sure you hit up Beecham Group and they can help you out. And keep space. So we've got some food at the back. 
Um, thanks to Keep Space. So they are in e-commerce, <laughs> e-commerce logistics. So they've got a, a warehouse here in Perth, a warehouse in Melbourne, a really cool app platform to connect the whole logistics process. So if you're shipping goods or if you've got an e-com store, check out the guys at Keep Space. Uh, sweet. And the new industries fund by the Department of Science, Technology, Innovation and tourism in a different order. Um, they are helping us with the live stream. So one cool thing we'd like to do is get this content out to the rest of the world, especially the regions in WA. So thank you very much to the, the New Industries Fund for making that happen. And a bunch of really supportive organisations. So Space Cubed, you're in a Space Cubed place today called Riff. There's a couple more down the road. There's Flux and Fern. So if you need a place to work, it's the best place to do it. Make sure you're subscribed to Startup News and Tech Board. Put your announcements there. Um, Startup News, I'll even send a journal out to your, your place and do a story on you. If you've got like a startup related story, you want to get the news out about what you're working on. Uh, and they put out content all the time about stuff happening in Perth startup land. Startup WA, they're our sort of body for the state government. So if you've got an issue or something that you'd like the state government to take care of in startup land, make sure you're a member of Startup WA, 100% free. So just become a member and you'll get their, their newsletter and you'll hear about what's going on. Uh, and Plus 8, you heard about Plus 8 last week uh, or two weeks ago. Um, they're still accepting applications for their accelerator for this year. So if you want to learn how to become a better entrepreneur, uh, you want some funding, you want to go on an immersive trip to, I think they're planning London this year, uh, that's, they'll take you over there, introduce you to awesome people, investors, everyone like that. It's a really cool platform, so if you've got a startup, think about joining Plus8. Morning Startup, as I said, we've been going for a long time now, we're Morning Startup on all the things, so get in touch with us if you're interested in doing a presentation here one day, it's always cool to hear from people that have really good startup stories and interesting content to tell, so get in touch, love to hear from you. This is coming in two weeks time, you might have heard, but AI is sort of a big deal at the moment, <laughs> and it's got a load of implications, right? So IP... How does that work? You know, you've got AIs now that are scraping your content and throwing it out there and you, maybe you want to do, a, do an AI startup and you're unsure about how IP works, you know, what can you do, what can't you do? So um, David Wilson has been going deep on this stuff. He's, a, he's an IP attorney, lawyer, and yeah, he's been going really deep and has some insights for you. So come along and learn how IP works in the new age of AI in two weeks' time. And that is formalities out the way. Still awesome. Um, and today we've got Matt Ainsworth and Jason Justin. They, I gotta say, like, one thing we love to do is like, give awesome startups that can hustle opportunities. And Matt definitely fits that, uh, fits that genre. So, um, as a startup founder, you feel like you're failing, like every single day. You might not get that contract, you might not get that win. And we're always told that, you know, you've got to bounce back from failure and failure is a learning experience and all that sort of stuff, but it's still stuck, it sucks, it still hurts, you know, and how do you bounce back from that? How do you get your, your mind in the right place to get up in the morning and just keep going? So that's what uh, Matt and Jason are going to help us with today, give us some practical strategies, some advice, some things you can, you can do to bounce back from failure, and please make them welcome, Matt and Jason. Thanks everyone, thanks for coming. Uh, my name is Matt, this is uh, Jason. Uh, so we'd be hearing from both of us. We have, uh, I guess, a little bit different perspectives when it comes to how we think about startups, but also our coaching style too. Um, so you'll start to hear that in the presentation as we go. So, supercharge your startup. Strategies for overcoming setbacks, struggles and stagnation. Does your startup journey ever look or feel something like this? Long journey ahead. No, it doesn't. All right, someone's pretty confident. That's great. That's great to see. For a lot of people, maybe it looks like this. However, obviously with all the recent announcements that we've had lately from VCs, from grants, from accelerators, you know, it's a really good time to be in the WA ecosystem. You know, there's ripe, ripe opportunities available. And of course, funding can really supercharge your startup if you get it. However, after checking numerous studies, um, 
there is around about 0.05% to 3% of companies only get funding. And so, what about the rest? So, if you don't get funding, if you're facing rejection, if you're having troubles financing yourself, what can you do? And so we've prepared our talk today as a kind of like a contingency plan to support you through those times. And I guess that's also the reason why I became a coach, to help people through navigating the troubles and the challenges that they face in their startup journey, but also to help people push themselves out of their comfort zone, all right, to help them reach their goals, to help them be, you know, reach their optimal performance as well. It sounds all really, you know, hoo-ha, but we'll get into some real practical strategies to show you how you can make yourself supercharged as well. So, a little bit about me. Um, so that's me right there at the beach, uh, Cottesloe, when I went to, um, was it, uh, Sculptures by the Sea. Uh, so I love stuff like cooking, going to the gym, I love cars, video games, and the startup scene. I'm originally from the east side, so, sorry, don't be offended. I love Perth now, so I've only been here four months, but everyone's been very kind. I spent eight and a half years in Tokyo, arrived in Perth back in December 2022. So I've only been here four months, four months young. Um, things I'm working on, BizMind is my coaching service that I started in Japan. Uh, it's targeted at startup founders and I still coach people there now. Startup Founder Mindset is what I'm working on with Jason. Um, so that's something that we've been doing currently and if you want to learn more about that, we have our next meetup next Thursday night, actually here in Reef. So talk to us about that if you're interested. And Skyrocket Startup Coaching, I guess, meetup group and platform is a very, very new education platform that I've started targeting um, at startup founders to help them really develop themselves, build resilience, work towards their goals, motivate them, etc. Jason. Thank you. Hi, I'm Jason Jeston. And uh, I'm a chartered accountant who's also a financial advisor and a business coach. And um, I actually am from Perth. Well, I arrived from France when I was 10 years old, actually. And uh, I became a chartered accountant here in uh, Perth. I grew up here. And then I decided to leave my job at Ernst & Young and go to London. And I was there for 14 years. And I had a sort of a life epiphany um, while I was in London that completely changed the way I saw the world. And uh, I decided to come back to Perth with my wife and two kids a little bit over a year ago. And uh, so today I'm sort of combining my financial skills um, with the coaching. And what I'm working on is my business called Breakthrough Business Coaching and Consulting. And as Matt said, I'm part of the starter Startup Founders Mindset Group, which is a really great group where we get to have a lot of fun digging really deep into some of the stuff we're going to give you a little flavor of today. But enough about us. We're here to talk about how to take your startup from stagnation, struggle, and setback to be supercharged. And what do we mean by that? Well, imagine, just imagine for a moment, a scrubby five-year-old kid wearing an orange t-shirt, running through the sprinklers on a hot summer's day, smell of freshly cut grass and uh, wind in his hair. I always loved running, but I could never run more than five kilometers. For 30 years, I dreamed of running a marathon, but I was too overweight, always stressed, and just not naturally athletic. I had the knowledge, okay? I'd done a lot of research into what training I needed to do, what I needed to eat, but something was missing. And so I came to believe that people like me just didn't run marathons. If I had a pair of glasses, that was the lens through which I saw the world. And I just accepted that's the way it was. But one day I met a girl who changed my life forever by telling me two simple words. And those two simple words caused me to challenge my beliefs and change my behaviors to throw away that old pair of glasses and put on a new set. And so within two months of those two words having been spoken, there I was running past the finish line in Paris, having just run my first sub four hour marathon. And as I stood there watching other people around me high-fiving and uh, taking selfies, this sense of calm came over me. 
I mean, I had just accomplished one of my life dreams in a sense. But for 30 years I was stuck. And in two months, I was able to get it done. I mean, what made the difference? Suddenly I realized beliefs shape behaviors and behaviors shape outcomes, but it starts with belief. And I think we all know this intuitively. I mean, even professional athletes like tennis players hire coaches to win championships. They know mindset is key to winning championships. And now, one thing you might be asking yourself right now is like, what on earth does this have anything to do with my startup? Well, let me ask you a question. What is the most valuable asset in your business? I'll give you a clue. It's not on your balance sheet. It's you guys. It's you, the people steering the ship. Your beliefs, your attitudes, your behaviors have more of an impact on outcomes than anything else. In fact, you could say you are your business. And there's a famous research article that discusses a concept called the knowledge action gap. Essentially, what they discovered is that you can have all the knowledge in the world, but knowledge by itself does not lead to action. There is a gap, something missing, and that is mindset. And so your mindset can show up as stagnation, struggle, or setback, or you can cultivate a mindset that consistently avoids, mitigates, or even leverages off challenges. It's the lens through which you interact and engage with the situation with which you bridge the knowledge action gap with a more empowering frame of reference. And that is what Matt and I are here to talk to you about today. So what are we talking about today? Basically, we're looking at introverts and extroverts, and I'll show you what I mean by that in a second. How to pitch with confidence. So obviously we've talked a lot about um, recently all the VCs that have announced um, they're injecting capital into the ecosystem, so how can you improve your pitch? How to persist through setbacks. If you get rejected by an investor, what can you do to get through that initial rejection and keep going? Next is overcoming funding challenges. If you're not getting the investment that you're seeking, what do you do? What are some contingency plans? What's a plan B? What's a plan C? How to get unstuck? That's really overcoming procrastination. How can I re-motivate myself if I'm feeling like shit or if I'm not moving anywhere, if I'm feeling stuck? How to identify your negative voice? Okay, that's a coaching exercise we'll go through to how to overcome self-doubt. We'll do a bit of a wrap up and then hopefully, time for meeting, we'll have some time for questions and or comments. So, introverts and extroverts, hands up if you think you're, you tend to be more of an introvert. Great, awesome. Hands up if you think you tend to be more of an extrovert. Awesome, you're all amazing people. Give yourself a pat on the back. Very good. So of course, you have your strengths and they're valuable for both your business, for what you do, for what you specialize in. However, introverts and extroverts also have things that they can work on. There's a whole bunch that we've listed right there. Specifically for me, Something that I worked on a lot was public speaking. So naturally, I think I tend to be more of an extrovert, but public speaking was a really big thing for me. I had to push myself out of the comfort zone to really get myself out there and get confident in speaking. I volunteered for things like this, Morning Startup, to really get myself out there and force myself to make my voice heard. Because I knew if I put, myself out, my, put my hand up, volunteered, I knew I could follow through and do it. And of course, public speaking, to improve, you can also practice, you can also practice in front of small groups and work your way up, get feedback, embrace the feedback, things like that. Other things that have worked on, self-promotion, active listening as a coach, after studying executive coaching, I really learned how to listen with empathy, how to see it from the speaker's point of view. And impulsiveness, I tend to buy things I guess I'm like that magpie that sees the aluminium foil and just grab it. So if I see something I like, I'll just buy it. I had to learn and teach myself that I had to consider the consequences of my actions. And so by doing that, I could actually make better decisions. I could actually problem solve better. Okay, so one example of an introvert who learned how to pitch with confidence 
Emma Isaacs, who is the founder of Business Chicks, she was so introverted that she needs to be by herself to recharge. And when she thought of public speaking or pitching, she got sick to the point that she almost threw up. So how did she overcome that? So what she did was she started by practicing in front of small groups, people she was comfortable with. She also tried to be authentic. And what I mean by that is she shared her own personal experiences, stories, and then through that experience, she was able to develop her own unique style of public speaking. And also through that, she was able to build her confidence. So that's one example. Which brings me to how can you pitch with confidence? And Jason will take us through that now. Thanks, Matt. Right. When we are selling our, our ideas, selling our ideas, the audience must first buy us. I think we all know this, and that's what causes us to feel so much pressure, but it's important to remember that doubt kills more dreams than failure ever will. Again, we can understand from a conceptual point of view that doubt is the problem, but what can we do about it? Well, when it comes down to pitching with confidence, have you ever felt endlessly fretted to prepare a presentation knowing so much was on the line? Or got that sinking feeling as the moment arrived that it was your turn to speak? Or struggled to maintain composure when you were delivering that speak, thinking you might be doing a bad job? Well, what do we know about this situation? Of course, it's important that our preparation be well-researched, thoroughly substantiated, and clearly explained. This is very useful, but how useful? Well, imagine if you could approach every pitch situation feeling solid, at ease, in your element, a sense of clarity about your worth, a sense of conviction about your cause, and the courage to stand for the impact that you were out to make. How would that feel? And how would that impact your business? And see, here's what some recommendations people give, is to visualize a positive outcome, to adopt a power pose, or to do some deep in-breaths and out-breaths to calm you down. And that is really brilliant. But it doesn't address the underlying cause, the underlying situation. It doesn't bridge the gap. Because the real problem, as we know, is that self-judgment caused by imposter syndrome, which is that little voice in your head that tells you you're not good enough, even though you are, and that you're going to fail. 70% of people say that they've experienced imposter syndrome at least once in their life. And I say the other 30% are probably too self-conscious to admit it. And now when it comes down to general advice, of course it's important to practice, to find your groove, get some feedback. It's important to pivot. If something doesn't feel right, doesn't feel authentic, change it, adapt. And it's important to push through. There will always be an element of feeling the fear and doing it anyway. But now when it comes down to adopting a more empowering frame of reference, imagine if you had a sort of way to diminish that self-judgment and adopt a more empowering perspective that naturally fed your confidence. Firstly, I would say, have some self-compassion because it's natural to worry what other people think. And even the people on the other side of the table who you may be presenting to, they themselves have doubt or imposter syndrome about certain things in their life. I mean, we're all human. We've got to remember that. My first concrete tip is to suggest that you cultivate a detached perspective as if from a th and look at your thoughts and feelings as if from a third-party perspective. See, when we worry, our negative thoughts and feelings are not the problem because they're always there in the background. Rather, it's our attachment to them. It's how we become fully identified and fully consumed by them, even though there's a whole other world happening out there. And so I would ask you in that situation, if you really look, what other thoughts and feelings could be present in this situation? And then to ask you, like, what would it be like to simply observe or notice your thoughts and feelings without judgment, without attachment? And admittedly, it can take some practice to develop this way of looking at your thoughts and feelings, which incidentally is the whole purpose of meditation. But when you do, it diminishes the negative influence those thoughts and feelings have. Point number two is what I call get real. Now, it's important to challenge your thoughts using evidence. 
So when you're worried about something going on, how that shows up is you've got a picture that you're playing out like a movie reel in your mind about how things are going to go badly. So I would encourage you to ask yourself these four questions. Firstly, what is the evidence from your past that supports the outcome going badly? Just be real about it. The second question would be, just imagine what would be the complete opposite of things going badly? Like what would be an absolutely ideal outcome? And the third question is, what's the evidence from your past to support things going really well, like the ideal outcome? Because I'm sure there have been moments in your past where you have had to step up to the plate with clarity, conviction, and courage, and you did a fantastic job. And the last question, once you've done that, is just to say, what's the most likely outcome, though? What's the most probable outcome? Is it going to be a train wreck? Ah, unlikely, you know. Is it going to be a smash it out the park kind of situation? Maybe, let's see. This sort of exercise helps you regain a balanced perspective and it works because evidence trumps belief. Lastly, I would encourage you to adopt a different definition of confidence. I think a more realistic one because we make confidence all about self-judgment. We make it about us. We're so worried about how we look, how we sound, what other people are thinking. And it's almost like we're walking around carrying this mirror that's reflecting back to ourselves. But let me tell you a little story. I'm scared of heights, right? So if you and I were out in the bush, standing at the base of a 10 meter high cliff, and you said to me, Jace, I'd be really impressed if you climbed that thing. There's no way in hell that I would, right? Because I'd be petrified. However, if we saw a child suddenly appear on the precipice of that cliff, potentially about to fall, and there was no other way that we could get around to helping them, what do you think would be going through my head? I'd probably start climbing that thing without giving it two thoughts. And the reason, and what do you think made the difference? I want you to consider that what made the difference is a sense of responsibility. And when you can get connected to the vision and the mission and the cause that you're out to impact, that is how you can reframe confidence simply as taking responsibility for your cause and the people you're out to serve. And I would say another way that you can embrace confidence is just to be comfortable with yourself. Okay, the more comfortable you are with yourself, the more naturally you can be confident with yourself as well. Moving on to rejection. If you're an early startup founder, or perhaps you're even somewhere along in your journey, I would say experiencing rejection is super important. The earlier you get to experience it, the better it is, because this is just part of the journey. Recognize that rejection is there, but also if you've experienced it once, then when it happens again, you can slowly get used to it, become more resilient, you'll learn how to embrace it better, and hopefully look for the opportunities that come with it as well. So, Rosslyn Kogan, probably everyone knows, hands up if you know, Rosslyn, no, okay. He runs an e-com business, Kogan.com, um, very famous. Maybe um, he's faced more rejections than Melanie in Canva, over 200. And it took him that long before he could actually get funding. And he only got funding from one single investor for $1 million as well. And even after he got that funding, he was still facing criticism. He was still facing skepticism from the industry. So he had to push and endure through all that rejection and heartache and challenge to build his platform. And now his platform is worth over $1 billion. That's one example of someone that's pushed through rejection. So Jason, what else can we do? Yeah, cool. Um, Thomas Edison famously said, I'm sure you've read this quote, I have not failed, I've simply found 10,000 ways that won't work. Second? I was thinking as AI say. <laughs> Maybe. But who here can say that they've tested their prototype or their MVP 10,000 times before it did anything close to useful? I mean, that is some serious grit, right? And what is grit? Grit is living life like it's a marathon, not a sprint. It's important to remember that this is a long-term game. You need to keep energy in reserve. And when it comes down to persevering despite setbacks, critically avoiding burnout, have you ever felt demoralized after 
your pitch was rejected, or been embroiled in politics between team members and co-founders, or had the rug pulled from under your feet when you're trying to scale and things don't go to plan, these sorts of situations are not just stressful and frustrating, they're downright demoralizing and they can knock you off your focus. And what do we know we need to do? Well, obviously we need to review our pitch and our presentation, think about what went well and what didn't go well. We need to understand different people's point of view in uh, politics. And we need to rejig our scaling plans. We need to look at what worked, what didn't work. Again, useful information, but how useful? And imagine if you could rest your head on your pillow every evening, feeling a sense of gratitude and ease and conviction about your worth. Receiving pitch rejection with resilience, like water off a duck's back, only absorbing what is useful. Or being, having like empathy to really approach every personality situation and transform those. And having the energy and focus and drive to tackle any situation that presented itself, whether it's scaling or issues. I mean, how would it be like to have that? And so here's the thing. When faced with these setbacks, quite often people can try and distract themselves or ignore it or just sink themselves harder into their work. And the thing about this is that it doesn't bridge the gap because the real problem is balance. Because fortunately or unfortunately, we are not ChatGPT. We're humans and we have a limited amount of bandwidth. And when our attention is stolen, that's when we're not able to show up with a good amount of creativity and drive to tackle situations. And in that situation, it's almost like you're driving your startup, which is like a Ferrari, 200 kilometers down a highway, actually looking out the back window. A recipe for disaster and potentially burnout. And so, of course, it's important to find a group of supportive, like-minded individuals like the one in this community. It's also important to set boundaries between home and work life to compartmentalize. And it's important to gain a fresh perspective. Just ask for help if you need it, honestly. You never know where a pearl of wisdom is going to come from. But now, when it comes ta time to adopting a more empowering frame of reference, Imagine if there was a way that no matter what happened, you knew that you were going to be at least okay. And that in fact you'd be able to navigate through different energy, um, um, energy levels to be able to find a state of flow to the point that you were welcoming challenges, actually welcoming challenges. Well, my first tip would be to choose. It's important to recognize that we chose this path and we are always in the driver's seat. We can always choose. And so I would ask you this though, if you're feeling a bit run down and set back, when it comes to your startup, why do you do what you do? And if you didn't have to do it, would you still do it? And if you decided to stop, what would you be giving up? It's important to reconnect with the passion that got us started in the first place, because that's how we can stop feeling like we're trapped and trying to escape something and look for the opportunities in a situation. My second point is to slow down to speed up. I mean, an empty tank ain't going to get you anywhere fast. It's important to manage your energy levels, but it's also important to remember that your energy levels are not correlated to the amount of time and effort that you put into things. Rather, it's your level of interest and engagement in those things. In fact, certain activities feed you energy. And so I would ask you to ask yourself, what's something you love doing that puts you back in your element, that revitalizes you? Could be anything that you could add into your week or into your day, even in small chunks, to help you get back to that state of who you are. Um, you know, because bodybuilders, they go to the gym to work out their muscles, but it's during the rest periods that those muscle fibers repair and grow, and it's the same with you in business. Self-care, rest, those are not optional. They're not luxury. They're mission critical. And so the third point is to encourage you to develop a growth mindset, to look at setbacks and failures simply as proof of progress, at least. 
and to ask yourself, what have I learned? Like, what have you learned today that means that you are going to be better equipped to deal with the challenges of tomorrow? Because the only way to not have setback or failure, the only way to guarantee that is to give up on our dreams, you know? Um, progress is never a straight line. And that's what I would recommend. Funding challenges? So, you've gone to seek funding, you've been rejected, you're having trouble with your finances. So you, this is probably the first um, startup that you've created, or maybe it's the fifth, but you're still experiencing some kind of financial challenge. What happens? Um, so, Sian Taid uh, is someone who bootstrapped her company for nine years. Um, Invado is very popular, very well-known digital product platform. If you don't know, they sell products for WordPress, for example. Um, she bootstrapped her company with her co-founders for two years. And for two years, uh, sorry, for nine years, but for two years, the company wasn't profitable. So how did they make it profitable? So instead, instead of seeking funding, they were bootstrapping it themselves, but other things that they were doing. They were being creative with their marketing strategies. For example, they started their own blog, which they could use to show off their creative designers' products. They were giving freebies away to some of their community, and they built a community through their platform as well, through an online forum. They also partnered with larger names in the industry to help them gain more traction. And through all of those activities, they were able to develop a platform that now has millions of users and over 500 staff globally. They did seek funding in 2015, but for nine years they were able to keep that going and build it into profitability even after two years. So if you're facing funding challenges, what are some other things you can do? Plan, have a plan B, have a plan C. What does plan B mean? If you only get partial funding, what are you gonna do? Plan C, if you get zero, then what are you gonna do? Reframe the setback as an opportunity. So if you're getting rejected from venture capitalists, from angel investors, see it as an opportunity to grow, to refine your pitch, to refine your product, even your business model, and then pitch again. Conviction is something that VCs actually want to see in their founders. So if you can grow from the experience, keep going. Look at it as an opportunity rather than rejection. If you're struggling for funding, look at other ways to embrace low-code tools, no-code tools, low-cost options, no-cost no options, free options, for example. You could consider, fun, consider funding alternatives, working part-time, freelance, to get you, your project off the ground. You could be trying to seek opportunity from grants, there's crowdfunding platforms you could embrace. There's whole, these days, there's a whole bunch, range of funding opportunities available other than VCs and angel investors. Focus on value. If you have a clear skill set you can offer as an additional value for your clients, do it, use it, help it to help you build your product and give more value to the client. And finally, stay resilient. Stay on track. You know, if you need to keep yourself like a visual or audio reminder to keep you on track, to keep you going, do it, build it. Have something there to keep you going, persisting through all the bullshit, I guess all the rejection, you know, all the funding challenges that you face. These are dark times, I've faced it too. I'm sure everyone's had a, you know, a time where they didn't feel like things were going well, but there are still many things you can do. Next one is how to get unstuck. So, overcoming procrastination. Jason? Brilliant. Thank you. Think about this for a moment. When everything feels like a struggle, think about the view from the top. But how often do we actually go and reconnect with what got us started in the first place? Maybe it's because it isn't the mountain ahead that wears you out, it's the pebble in your shoe. We live in a very noisy world, very di there's a lot of distractions. And so when it comes down to getting unstuck, I want to talk to you about the purpose of purpose. Have you ever felt really unclear about what strategic direction to take your business in? Or struggled to communicate your unique value proposition, or felt lost about how to engage or motivate team members, staff, let alone yourself. And what do we know about the situation? Well, in business, people make decisions based on practical considerations, rationale, 
which is really important, but it's easy to get lost in the detail and lose sight of the bigger picture. And besides, our stakeholders, most of them, are humans. And humans intuitively make decisions based on emotions. So for example, your customer needs to be feeling emotionally connected to your strategic direction. Anybody you're presenting to needs to actually feel the worth of your unique value proposition. And you yourself and your team need to know why you do what you do. And so imagine if you could wake up every morning with drive and passion, like eager to climb a little further up your second mountain and plant another flag. You know, certain about your strategic direction at every stage of your business, able to articulate your unique value proposition with conviction and the impact you're out to make and use that to motivate your staff, your team, yourself. Here's part of the problem. People look to the competition and they sometimes just simply copy or tweak the competition's strategic direction. Or they think simply having a UVP that's different is good enough. Or they think that money is the best or most cost effective means of engaging or motivating staff. But none of these address the gap because the real problem is alignment. Alignment. When what you do does not align with who you are, your authentic self, there is a cost. Part of that cost is that clarity, courage, and conviction. Another cost is an opportunity cost because no form of success can give you lasting joy, fulfillment, or prosperity when that success is disconnected from who you really are as a person, which is why, like they say, you need to start with your why. And now, of course, it is important that your business be sustainable economically, 100%. Money is the lifeblood of any business. It's important that your problem is a big one, the one you're solving, and that it matter to a great many people. But now when it comes down to adopting a more empowering frame of reference, imagine if you had a sort of internal compass to help guide you and a map that laid out all the non-negotiables along the terrain and a clearly articulated northern star to aim for and that you could use this combination of things to align every aspect of your business so that you could make effective and efficient decisions at every stage of your business. Well, the first thing I would mention is that self-reflection is your compass. You really need to ask yourself, what is the version of my strategic direction that best aligns to my personal purpose? And when you answer this question, you really need to ask it more than just up here. It needs to make sense in your gut and in your heart. And this is something Matt's gonna go through in the next slide. But the second point is to evaluate the situation. Our values are those non-negotiables on the map. And our values drive us, whether we know it or not. So you really need to ask yourself, what is it that you really care about, that you want your business to care about and the right stakeholders because the value of values is more than just in the fact that it can align us, it also connects us with the right stakeholders. And thirdly is to envision the situation. You need to really ask yourself, what is the ultimate aim of your business that aligns to your personal vision? Because when you really get connected to that, it is what is going to be a much bigger motivator than any sort of willpower, inspiration, or habit hack. So Jason spoke about how you can self-reflect, but how can you do it to recharge yourself? There's a few different ways. Take some time out regularly. Do it weekly. Do it daily. Identify the triggers. What's causing you to procrastinate? What's the situation? What time of the day? Meditate. How often do you meditate, Jason? There you go, living proof. Turn your larger tasks into smaller, manageable chunks. If it's a big project, if it's looking daunting, if it's looking overwhelming, try to look, manage it and divide it into small, manageable pieces so it doesn't look so, over, so daunting to start to begin. Journal everything, write everything down. If, something's, if you're starting to feel overwhelmed to the point that you can't move, to the, that you can't motivate yourself, 
write it down. Then look at it, try to look at it from a third perspective. How does that feel? And then think about it in terms of task allocation versus time allocation. Maybe you set some time aside already and span some tasks over a certain period of time. Instead of doing that, allocate time for a specific task. See how that works. Finally, the coaching exercise that I wanted to do with you today is how to identify your negative voice. It's that self-doubt that goes through your mind. So, let's see. Hands up if you like people talking down to you. Hands up if you like people talking negatively to you. Great. I'm glad I got that response. So, there's a famous quote by Anna Akana, who's a famous YouTuber. She says, I know a lot of us have a tendency to have overtly negative self-talk, but would you tolerate that kind of dialogue from an actual other person? So, um, we probably don't have time today, but I asked ChatGPT to create a story about that, and it did. Um, with Dali, two images as well. So you can see Max, the fake founder of Green Tech Innovations. He's not a real person, by the way. Um, these are all created. These are some of Green Tech's um, marketing material. You can see that they work in the energy sector as well. So basically, what I'll do is I'll link the story on LinkedIn. If you're following me, you can see the full story there. But basically what um, ChatGPT came up with was Max was someone who was struggling with negative self-talk and often doubted his skills. After his coach asked him about it, basically saying, why would you tolerate that kind of talk, that kind of self-negative talk? Would you tolerate that from an actual other person? When Max heard that, he realised, ah, oh, shit. I probably shouldn't be doing that to myself if I can't tolerate it from other people. So from there, whenever a negative, third em a th negative thought emerged, he challenged it. He learned to work with it. He learned to overcome it. He learned to separate it from his other thoughts. But so how can you do that? So maybe it helps to close your eyes with this exercise, I'm not sure. We'll run through it quickly. If you want a copy of the material, come and see me after. I can give you the slides as well. So first of all, when was the last time you heard your negative voice? What was the situation? What was the trigger? What was it trying to tell you? That's first. Second, now try to personify that voice. As a cartoon character, as a monster, what's visually something that works for you? How big is it? How small is it? And what does it want from you? And finally, setting some new guidelines for it. What happens when you put the voice far away from you? Maybe it's down the road, maybe it's out on Cottesloe Beach, maybe it's in another country. What happens then? How can you distract the voice the next time it starts talking? And what happens when you distract it? And finally, think about what are the new guidelines you want to set for this voice. And so the next time it shows up, how can you work with it better? That's a very fast-forwarded version. Normally we would go through that a lot slower, but just time permitting. That's essentially the process that we take. So let's sum up. To supercharge means to overcome setbacks, to overcome struggle to overcome stagnation. So introverts and extroverts, you all have positive qualities. Even introverts can learn how to pitch well. So how to pitch with confidence. I think we talked about obviously practice, but also learning to detach yourself from your thoughts, but also identify the negative voice as well, help you to separate those thoughts. Persisting through rejection shows conviction, shows resilience, okay? But it's also an important part of the journey, too. Funding challenges are common, but also an opportunity. Fighting procrastination, it takes effort, it takes commitment, but through things like self-reflection, okay, you can use it as an opportunity to recharge yourself. And finally, if all else fails, Identify your negative voice to help you overcome some of that 
self-doubt. It doesn't work overnight, but with continued practice and conviction and hard work, you can learn to work with it a lot better. So the final question I want to ask you guys, what value can you guys take from this session? Hopefully something. So thanks everyone. Uh, thanks from Jason. If you have any questions or comments, now's the time. And here's our QR codes if you want to get in touch with us. If you want a copy of the slides, please DM us Supercharge on LinkedIn or email us. We can send you the slides or anything else you're interested in. Or even if you're interested in coaching, feel free to reach out. Thanks, everybody. We sliced it down. So, um, yeah, any questions? Yeah, I've got one. So, I'll just bring a mic back to you for the uh, folks on the live stream there. So, I really like uh, what you guys said about the, the negative voice, the self doubt. Uh, what, what I struggle is um, some of the negative voice sometimes is, it's like a wisdom, like right? it's, it's trying to figure out. What is a strength and what is a weakness? Is the idea workable or is it doomed to failure? Is it, is it something that actually can work or is it something that is not uh, compatible or is, is there a mismatch? And, and, and I think that's where I get stuck. Like, I'm, I'm really good at troubleshooting stuff. Oh, I think I am. But at the, by the same token, I can be really, I can really drown in that as well. Yeah. So I don't know if there's a question in there. Where, how do I know the difference? Maybe, maybe that's the question. Yeah, so good question. But I think it's like everything. Um, you need to put it in perspective. When you hear the negative voice, obviously that's the brain going into defensive mode, right? Um, so there's a reason probably for it to do that. Um, if you're having trouble, like identifying whether it's an opportunity or whether it's actually you know, going into defensive mode, I think you need to write everything down, you know, probably take some time away from it, come back to it and review it. Okay, so while that exercise helps you, you know, separate your thoughts, okay, obviously it doesn't, it's not gonna work all the time. We're talking in the perspective of you know, facing rejection or overcoming self-doubt that's when you would use it. But if you put it in perspective, right, sometimes it's actually good to have that negative voice because it's, you know, it's an alarm bell, yeah. right? Um, maybe there's an element as well of um, kind of being stuck up here sometimes, you know? I mean, like, why do our best ideas sometimes come from places like when we're having a shower? You ever got like a, like a light bulb moment? And I think, you know, they, they, it's possible without exploring in, in depth really what's going on there that sometimes, you know, um, you need a pattern interrupt and you need to, we can get stuck trying to figure things out, but then there'll be something we can do to just open up to the intelligence which is within us basically and give us a, a, an insight into what actually we, we feel about something, you know, because we can get lost in our thoughts and it's like a kind of a dead end. <laughs> yeah. You know? yeah. yeah. One question? Oh. Sorry, just a quick one. Coming back to your story, Justin, about the marathon, what were the two words that she actually said to you? Because I'm like, yeah. that just like had me hooked the whole... <laughs> yeah, there's a bit of a story there, but um, there's a whole bunch of other stories, really. But um, I was just in a place where I was um, stuck in my head. I really was stuck in my head. And so um, I started running and, um, you know, but just a few kilometers because I needed to shake myself out of my head. And it works actually, it really works. Um, but what happened was I got to a point where I was like, you know what, I think I'm okay. But then I caught myself because I realized that I was on the up curve like I normally do in life. And I was just going to swing back down and stuff. And I said, I need to do something that is going to break the cycle and help me redefine my identity of self. And, um, yeah, so I thought, gosh, 
been running these few kilometers, not bad. What would be something inspirational? Half marathon? What about a full marathon? <laughs> and I went to a friend of mine, this girl who um, had run lots of marathon, and I said, like, what's a good training program that I could try on to see whether it works or whatever? And she let me say my piece, and then she just looked at me and she said, book it. Book it. And I was like, I don't get it. I've asked you about a training program. So, oh, I get it. Commit. Commit. Right. And so from that point on, I basically was like, I'm doing it. I'm doing this. And like I said, like two months later, it was like, boom, done. Only marathon I've ever run. But it was, and the only thing I got from it really was that redefinition of my own identity. It was like, do you know what? Like, and this is relevant to all of us as humans, you know. We are capable of so much if we just get out of our own way. <laughs> nice. More questions? No more questions? All right. Well, are you guys going to hang around for half an hour? Yep. If you do have more questions, or you've got questions for other people in the audience and you want to get to know people, please, um, please do so. But thank you very much, Matt and Jason. Woo! Well done. <laughs> Hope you all got something out of that. Uh, so, like I said earlier, um, the next session in two weeks' time is all about the IP story around all of the, the new AI technology that's going on, so please come along and, and learn about that. And we've got Founder Sundowner, I think is next week, or the first Wednesday of the month, whatever that, then that falls. But thanks so much for coming. We've got some food at the back from Keep Space, so um, fill your stomachs and get to know each other. Thanks, guys. See you at the next one. <laughs>